Good morning, folks. Lovely to see you all. Welcome to Auburn Baptist Church. It's lovely to be able to gather together and come in out of the weather and just rest and invite God to lead us this morning. That's what we're going to do. We're going to break bread together. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to get into God's Word. And we're going to create room for a bit of storytelling. Who loves a good story? Who loves... Who loves a good story? Who's got memories of being told a fantastic story full of adventure? An adventure story. Three of us. Good. Well, the rest of you can, uh, can just take a deep breath and we'll play on through. I'm going to invite you to consider when we come to the table, we're asked to remember. And so, what do we remember about our adventure with Jesus? Do you have a moment, a memory, looking back on? So just plant that seed as we get into that. But let's pray and worship this morning. Two familiar, well, one familiar song to start, one somewhat recent song from uh, Matthew and Becky Anderson's friends, from Duncan and Shona Cullens based on Psalm 46, but let's start with a prayer, then we're going to sing, Great is the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to come into this space and to honour you, first and foremost, God, that is why we are here. We're not here for ourselves primarily, we're here to glorify the living God. But we thank you, God, that in, in the midst of this moment that you meet us and that you minister to us, that as we worship your spirit is moving through us and, and speaking to us. And as we open your word, your truth is changing us. And as we break bread, we are reminded of the, the, the level of love, the depths of love that was shown to us on the cross. Father, come and lead us, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's stand together. We're going to sing this song. The chorus uh, is one that, if you don't know the verse, you'll remember the chorus. And Lord, we want to lift your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives. And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone. that we're singing and let's just personalize it for a minute as we do so in prayer let's just have the the chorus words up and let's just rest and read them and let's just as we read them within ourselves let's just give thanks to God for first and foremost for who he is 
that we don't have to rely on the very best that we can manage or the very best that humanity can muster, but that we have a God in heaven that we can lift his name up because he is greater than all. And then we think about what he's done for us personally. We want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives as we come to the table and as we remember the God of heaven, the living God, who is very personal to us. What has he done in your life? And if you're struggling to think of something and you, because you're so focused on something that you want to see change, then you can give thanks that God is the God of heaven who can bring about that change. And then the invitation to trust. We all know love in our lives, but there is one who is perfect love. That is unfailing love. And so this morning we can come and we can fix our eyes on that and remember that everything around us that is love is a reflection, an imperfect reflection of the perfect love. And so God, we thank you that you can inspire us to love better. And that in the midst of that, we can fix our eyes on the perfect love. And then the promise of eternity that is found only in God through Christ Jesus. That you are God eternal, only you. Let's sing that song one more time. And as we get to this chorus, let's just give thanks to God for all that we're reflecting on. Great is the Lord and most worthy the city of our God, the holy place, the joy of the thanks to the living God who is making a difference in our lives who is the source of everything that is good we're going to get to that when we open the word that you are the source of everything that is good and you are the one that that reveals to us and holds for us the promise that we can rejoice in that we can look forward to in Christ This song is based on Psalm 46. We've heard it a few times. I think this is the first time we've actually sung it. It's a beautiful song by, by Matthew and Becky's friends. The chorus goes as follows. For there is a river whose streams be glad The city over the city over he is within her, she will not be moved. His help comes at break of day, his help comes at break of day. This song reminds us from Psalm 46 that, that God is our ever-present help in time of need. He is our refuge and our strength. 
And if that is a word for you this morning, then I just encourage you to take it on board that God is speaking from his word to you. Let's sing together. The Lord is our refuge and strength. And our very present help. We will Psalm 46 paints the picture of, of the city of God and we thank you God that actually as Jesus said there will come a day where you won't worship God on this particular hill but actually will worship God in spirit and in truth and therefore we will find that refuge and strength wherever we are because of the spirit of God. So thank you Father that even this morning in this thoroughly secular space through the week we can bring something of the kingdom of god and of of heaven into it and find your refuge and strength in jesus mighty name amen well who who loves the bake-off who's been watching the bake-off who's come across the australian bake-off a couple of you, which I think, yeah, we've been enjoying more. It seems to be more about the baking, um, which has been great. And uh, But it's fantastic to see people creating something 
out of a whole range of different ingredients. And so this morning we're going to have our very own Bake Off in church. Who's, who's up for watching that? Who's up for that? So I'm going to invite Amy Rose to come forward this morning. We've got a picture actually, Isaac, that is going to just give us a bit of a, a taste for what's to come. Let's see what I did. So we've got a, a mixing bowl, which uh, looks a little bit medicinal, but it is a mixing bowl, I promise, and that's all it's ever been used for. Let's just make that clear. So I'm going to put that on the floor, because the more important thing is coming. We need a whole range of things to create. And so I want to invite you to shout out, what do you think we would need to create a cake? A cake. So go for it. Yeah, yeah. Go for it at the back. Eggs. Let's see if we've got some eggs in here. Here they rose. If you could have a look and see. There's an egg in there just with some toilet roll to keep it from breaking. So we've got an egg. Anything else, folks? Naomi, what else might we need? Sugar. Sugar, 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 I've got some sugar, there we go. Anything else? Flour. We have got gluten free gluten free. Gluten free flour. Try and say that three times really fast. Go. Gluten free flour. Gluten free flour. No, I can't do it. Okay, gluten free flour. There we go. Just try it. No, no, that's a bad idea. Uh, anything else? So we've got eggs, sugar, flour. David. Oh, we don't have any chocolate, David, sorry. But kindred spirits, there we are. You've got my heart on that. Butter, butter, butter. Let's try it. Let's see how good you are. Okay, just balance in there. Let's see. Let's see. The flour would have been disastrous, but you're doing well. Well done, love. Okay, yes, go for it. Go for it. Milk. We don't have milk, and that was a question that I asked. And apparently, apparently, listen, <laughs> if I'm wrong, it's okay, it's only butter, not spilt milk. Bethany, say today. Hi, love. You came to help? Oh, thank you, darling. There you are. Right, so apparently you don't have to have milk. I'm, I'm looking up. Listen, hey. Sodium, we haven't got any bicarb. No, no. No. What else we need? We need something to mix it with. Some kind of uh, implement, I'm going to say, weapon. To mix it with. So Bethany, can I ask for your help? Could you hold this for me, please, love? If I take that. What we're going to do is we're going to pour everything into this bowl. You ready? So, how much, how many spoonfuls of sugar will we put in, do you think? Who's got a sweet tooth? Naomi, what do you think? Two. Two. So, Naomi, hold that. Bethany, you hold the bowl. Gary, hold the sugar. I'm going to put two of these in. So I apologise to the janitor afterwards. Okay, one, thank you, two, there we go, thanks very much, that's great, okay, and then the butter, where's the butter, I've got the butter, how much butter, just a, a dollop, all of it, thank you, let's just get it right in there, oh, and it's stuck to the lid, there we are, so if you would do the honours of that, thank you, put a right good dollop in there, Nice. Good. Is that a baking term? Dollop yes. is now great. So we've got sugar, we've got, we've got <laughs> the butter. I'm going to totally destroy the gluten free flour because I'm going to put the spoon with the butter in the gluten free flour. But hey, listen, we're baking. Yeah. Baking's a messy thing. What do they? What do they? How many spoonfuls of gluten free flour? Same as the sugar. Same as the sugar. We're learning something, folks. Who came to church to learn? Woo! Here we go. One. That's a big one. Perhaps that's the one. Thank you. Right, you want that love? Okay, and the last thing is the egg. Half of that. No worries. Listen, hey, come on. We can do we can do all things. We're expert. You hold that. Okay, go over there. I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. So how are we gonna do this? Without making a mess. Nice and carefully. So I wonder if we could use the spoon. Should we try it? Just give it, give it a little thump. That's it, love. Harder, harder. Oh, there we go. Well done. Right, I'm going to ask you to do this, Eddie, because you can wash your hands. Because I can't really. There we go. Get it in there. Now, what's the next step? What's the next step? 
Yeah, here we are, Ellie. Ellie. Come down there. There we go. Mix it. So, right, guys, muscle. Let me see your muscles before you start. Hang on, hang on. Let me see your muscles. Let me see them. One arm each. Will that do, folks? Is that enough muscle? I think it's enough muscle. Let's go. Okay. That's it. Okay. Any plans for lunch? No? 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 What time's the book until Linda? There we go. Oh, that was good. Okay, that's it. You're good at this, guys. Okay. Well done. It looks what? It looks disgusting. It doesn't, it doesn't look pleasant so far. So we've got sugar, eggs, flour, and butter. So there's going to be some flavour. David, I hear you. There could have been a, 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 an extra thing that would have given us a wee bit more flavour. Thank you. It looks like icing. Is that good? Is that how it should be? Okay. I have no idea. Great. There we go. So fantastic. So I want you to imagine that you are like a cake. Turn to the person that you say you're just like a cake. You're just like a cake, full of a range of, of ingredients. What kind of cake are you? Turn back to the person beside you and say, I think I'm a bit of a... If you're a bit of a fruit loaf, then there's prayer available for that. Sultanas, raisins. Chocolate. Chocolate. Okay, who, who's a chocolate cake? David O'Brien. Yeah. Who's a bit more uh, bit more extravagant than chocolate cake? Cinnamon. Coffee and walnut. Yeah, that thing we would. Yeah, there's a bit of nut in there, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, coffee and walnut. Great. So, that's us. We just like a cake. We're full of different ingredients that make up who we are. Different qualities. Different attributes. I want you to imagine that, that this is just like what God would say of us. That when we trust in Him, we can have a little bit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I always feel a bit of the burn there when I'm going to start, start listening stuff. Different ingredients that come by the Spirit and make us who we are into the beautiful cakes. That we are, but what we see is we're all a bit different. Different flavours. Some of you are gluten-free cake. Some of you are not. Some of you are dairy-free. Who's a dairy-free cake? Any dairy-free cakes in here? Sometimes. Who who um, who is a I absolutely no sultanas in my cake? Quite a few. Yeah. Who who is a definitely no nuts in my cake? No crunch. There's a bit of crunch in this, I think, because of the eggshell. <laughs> but that's fine. So that's the picture of who we are in God. But here's the thing. Sure, sure it's clean before I put it near my Bible. Here's the thing. We're not just love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I've done it again, haven't I? I'm going to just not bother trying again. Um, we're also imperfect. And you know, sometimes we find we've got little flavours in us that are not really what should be there, like a bit of paprika. Oh, who loves a bit of paprika in your cake? Come on. Maybe you've also got a little bit of onion, ground onion. Yeah? Anyone ever felt, ever, you get up in the morning, I'm a little bit ground onion today. Yeah? Well, that bit wasn't very ground. Mmm, it's just smelling fantastic, by the way. Come to us for lunch, this is what you're getting. Uh, maybe sometimes you're a little bit garlic. Yeah. Doesn't sound good, wait till you taste it. Uh, and then, you know, I think we're all a little bit mixed herbs. We're all a little bit mixed herbs. Sometimes, well, that's not a little bit mixed herbs. That's a lot. 
Let me just, oh. Right, Naomi, come back again. Take this back up around the church, let's have a look and see. Folks, if you've got a nervous disposition, then look away. Naomi, go for it. Take that round and let's have a look and see. If you want to have a little smell, folks, feel free. There are ingredients that God speaks over us. Love, joy, I've done it again. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Come on. That is the makeup of the people of God. But we also, sometimes, we can be a little bit impatient. Sometimes we can get a little bit angry, a little bit frustrated. Sometimes we can lift things up above God when actually we should put God above all things. Sometimes ingredients in our lives are not quite as they should be. Let's turn to the Word, shall we, to redeem this moment. Let's look at the two scriptures. Our first one. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. So, we've got the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control that comes from the Spirit. Maybe you've been raised well by your parents as well and that you think, actually, you know, I'm going to live a certain way because I was brought up that way. But here's the thing. Do we always live at peace with each other? Who's, I'm not going to say specifically, but who lives with other people in a family context? Let's not name relationships. But who lives with other people or has done and realised that we don't always live at peace with people? Why? Because other ingredients sometimes get into the mix. Ingredients that shouldn't be there. Be holy. What does be holy mean? It doesn't mean that when it rains, the water sprays out of your arms and your legs fill up. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart, to be different as God wants us to be. So live at peace and be holy. So here's a challenge. That is a challenge for us. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And you think, well, that's it. I'm scuppered. Because I can't be perfectly set apart. And that's when we look to Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus, that your blood shed on the cross cleanses me of all of my unfortunate ingredients. Next slide. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, sir. If we confess our sins, so if we say, I've got a little bit of garlic, I'm a little bit onion, I'm actually far more mixed herbs and paprika than I should be, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Who is faithful? He is faithful. God is faithful and just and might, maybe, if he's in a good mood, only on a Tuesday between the hours of three and four. No, he will. Everyone say will. If there's somebody called will here, I'm really sorry if that's woken you up. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. He will purify us from all of our garlic, all of our paprika, all of our mixed herbs and all of our onion. That is the goodness of God. Now, you might think, Stuart, it's part of who I am. I, I just, I feel like it's just mixed up in this mixture of who I am. And you think, Stuart, how are you gonna get the mixed herbs, the paprika, and the uh, onion and the garlic, thank you. How are we going to get that out of this? How do we get it out of there? Caden, can you Trump come and try and get that out? Come and try and get it out. I'll give you the spoon here. Come and try and get it all out. Do you think you're going to manage? Try and get it all out. No? That bit there? We're going to need a bigger spoon. <laughs> that is going to be the phrase for next year, I think. That's, our, that's it's not our scripture for the year, it's our phrase for the year. We're going to need a bigger spoon. It seems impossible, doesn't it, Katie? It seems impossible because it seems like it's mixed up and it's part of who we are. Thank you, Katie. Well done. Can we, in our own minds, understand how God can change us and make us new? No, we can't understand it. It looks impossible. 
But we turn to the word of God and the promise that in Jesus, he can do it. He can make us new. He can change us and transform us. And so, folks, that's a word for all of us, for myself as well. If you feel like, Lord, remove the garlic from my nature. Now, of course, garlic is good. Onion is good. Paprika is really good. Mixed herbs at times are fantastic. But beyond the illustration, Father, there's bits of me, my, my nature, my character that needs to change still. Help me. Who, who can relate to that? Am I just putting my hand up here? Anybody else? Thank you, folks, for your honesty. We don't have to understand how he's going to do it. We just have to trust that he can and trust that when we ask him, he will. Amen? Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that that did not create an absolute disaster at our feet for the janitor's sake. Father, thank you for the promise that is in your word, that you, you show us all the good that is from you, all the egg, butter, flour, sugar, and the chocolate. But you also remind us, God, of things that are mixed up in it as well, that, that you want to take from us to make us more like Jesus. So let's just say, Father, help us, we pray. We don't know how you do it, but we know you can. We know that you invite us to partner with you in it. Lead us on the path towards being set apart in Jesus' mighty name. Let's just rest for the next five minutes and just concentrate once again on, on the goodness of God found in Jesus Christ. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him. To bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the serving King. From him you came, helpless be. Enter that world, your glory reign. Not to be served, but to be served. And give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow. To bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. There in the garden. Come see 
his hands and his feet The scars that speak of sad regrets Hands that flung stars into space this morning? Who are we choosing to lay our lives down for? Revelation 1 verse 17. John has an encounter with this servant king who is now enthroned on high. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Who are we following this morning? We're following the one who was dead and is now alive. We're following the one who has gone through death and come out the other side and who holds the keys to death. And so, even death has been defeated. Praise God. Is there anybody else that can make that claim? Absolutely not. That is the one that we are serving. Let's go to John 14 together just for a brief moment. Look at verse 23. Jesus speaking to his friends said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and will come to him and make, and we will make our home with him. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. It is a God who is personal, who is almighty and, and other. He is the greatest, and yet he comes, and he is willing to be alongside us, to walk with us through everything. Who is the God that we serve? Who is the servant king, the one who came to serve? He is the one who has gone through death, 
come out the other side and holds the keys to death. We don't have to fear anything because of him. Praise God. We're going to begin a two-part series. Uh, can you call two weeks a series? Probably not. It's probably a bit generous. We're going to do two weeks on Revelation. Um, and we did Revelation in more in depth. I think there's maybe eight sessions on it in 2019. So, And there are lots of great resources on Revelation out there for you to go and look at. So we're not going to go into it in any depth. We're going to top and tail Revelation over the next fortnight. As we, as we finish, as we come to the conclusion of our chronology, three years through the Bible, before we get to our Advent uh, services at the start of December, we're going to look at the world and the church and the church in the world for the next fortnight. And the focus of today is going to be on chapters 2 and 3. If you've got a Bible, then again, if you've got Revelation open, then you can, uh, you can look at that with us. And it contains... In chapters 2 and 3, letters from Jesus through John to specific churches. Who'd love to get a letter from Jesus? Wouldn't that be great? Well, you think that would be fantastic. And then you read the letter and you think, well, do you know, bits of that letter, I loved bits of that letter, but other bits. Bits of that letter were like the egg and the flour and the sugar and the butter, but some bits of that letter were a little bit garlic and paprika. We're going to see that this morning as we journey. Literal churches that were planted by the apostles and by the disciples of the apostles as part of the mission of God. They're churches that have grown over decades, depending on when we date Revelation. Some would date it quite early. I think the majority of people would date it later, date it around about uh, the end of the first century. There is debate, of course, on that. Um, but they're churches that have grown over the period of time and most are still conveying something of Jesus to their community. Still representing Jesus in cultures that are not unlike ours. Whoever looks out and thinks, man, the world's in a mess. Well, that nothing is new under the sun. When we go back to the end of the first century, every culture had a bit of that in it. It had a bit of the garlic in it, a bit of the onion, a bit of the mixed herbs, and a, a bit of the stuff that actually God was trying to beckon people out of. Nothing new under the sun. But there are also churches that are struggling in light of the, the pushback that they get for being people of faith. Who's ever had pushback for being a person of faith? If we're not, if we're not feeling that, then we have to examine our lives and think, well, am I actually being bold. If I'm not getting pushed back, then am I actually standing for Jesus? When we stand for Jesus, we get pushed back. That's just what happens. Because the world is, is at work uh, in, the, in the culture around us. It's so important though for us to ground this moment in understanding who is speaking. We've mentioned who is speaking. Who is this Jesus issuing his assessment of the church that he's writing to. Well, let's fly through the Word of God. Uh, just chapter 1, verse 17. Don't worry, Stuart, because I'm going to go really quick, so I don't want you... Uh, it's a carpal tunnel people get from there. I don't want to injure you this morning. He's we've heard that he is the first and the last, the living one. Chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. The one who was dead and is now alive. Chapter 2, verse 1. He is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. What does that mean? Well, let's get into that maybe some other time. But he is the one who holds the churches and the, the leaders and, and the hope and the truth in his hands. Right to the angel of the church at Smyrna. Who is it who's writing? Well, it is the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. Verse 8. Who is this one who is speaking? I've done verse 8. Let's go on to verse 12. Uh, but he writes to Pergamum, the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. That was verse 12. Let's go to verse 18. Who is it that's writing? It's the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. Chapter 3, verse 1. The one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Verse 7. He's the one 
who is the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one will open. In verse 14, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. Amazing. This is the one who's speaking, trying to paint the picture for John and for the churches and for us that he's other, he's different, he's greater. If we think we've personally got it all sorted, we have to remember he is greater than even our best. He is greater. He's greater than the best leader the world has ever known. He's greater than all. Amazing. Elevating Christ, elevating God. It's also important for us to note the people who are truly part of God's church will view Christ in that way. Some churches today are trying to bring him down to our level to the point where they're robbing him of his otherness, his glory. Some are just trying to pay a picture that he was just a good man that can inspire us on. We want to say no. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the first and the last. Why is that phrase important? Because that is the phrase that God speaks of himself. And Jesus in Revelation is saying, in this moment, I am God. That is who we follow. Praise God. Let's never, never bring Jesus down to the point where we diminish who he is. He is Lord and Saviour. And in these letters, he's reaching out to a people whom he loves. How do we know that it's the people who he loves? Because he's writing to them. If you really don't like someone, do you write to them with the words of love and encouragement? Probably not. Do you care enough to actually address the things that are going on in their lives? Probably not. How do we know he loves them? Because he says, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the church. If you love someone, you will speak out of your love if they're walking away, if they're on the wrong path. If you love them, you'll speak. And Jesus loves his people. It's like he's saying, please, please listen, please hear that longing of God. He's also speaking to a people who have been commissioned out into the world, into a system and a set of beliefs that are contrary to God's way. He knows what the world's like because he, he created it, he knows all things, and also, importantly, he's walked the path that you and I walk. So he knows what it's like. This is a Jesus that we can connect with, that we can have relationship with. He gets it. Whatever you're going through this morning, he gets it, he understands. A people called to go, a people called to be different, to be set apart, to be holy. And a people called not to conform to the world, but to be phrases like salt and light, to bring to the world what it needs, and that is Jesus, and to change the world through the gospel, that is through the teachings of Christ, through the truth of Christ, and importantly, through the power of God's kingdom. You carry that when you leave your house. How exciting is that? You're not just George. You're not just George. But you are George, who knows the truth of Christ and who carries the power of God's kingdom wherever you go. Maybe you're not George, don't panic, whatever your name is. But you get me. You aren't just yourself, the substance of you. You are more because of Christ. Isn't that an exciting thought? But also, it, it places a challenge upon us. So he's speaking to the, the people that he's called, commissioned, he's empowered, that he loves. He's also speaking from a place of being the perfect voice, the perfect one to assess, the perfect one to make righteous judgments, and the person who has the right to speak. What does he say? Well, we've got slides to show. Um, it should be a revelation keynote there. 
He speaks to seven churches. We won't, for, for time's sake, go through each church. But let's just scroll through. We're going to look. Each church is given things they're doing well. This is kind of like primary school. Two stars and a wish. Not every church gets the two stars. And uh, they all get the wish. A wish of some kind. Some get more than two stars. Some get a lot of encouragement. Some not as much. And he offers his solution. He says, listen, here's what's going really well. Here's what we need to change. Here's how to do it. And this is what I love. I want us to take away this this morning. The one who loves us is lovingly speaking to us and also promising something to us. The seven churches are given a promise. They're given a promise that there is something beautiful to lay hold of. There's something coming that not even the gates of hell can withhold and withstand. There's something coming that not even all the noise of the world can stop from coming to be. And that is a recreated, re-established, remade, eternal reality of God and his people in loving relationship. Does that excite anyone this morning? Who thinks the world, thank you Helen, come on. Who thinks the world needs that? I think we see it. When we pray for what we see in front of us, what is the solution? The solution is, yes, let's be more kind, let's be more nice. But ultimately the solution is, let's fall on our face before the throne of heaven and lay down everything and say, you will be done, Father. And so that is the call that is put to Ephesus. Let's keep going through them, Stuart. Thank you, just nice and uh, Smyrna gets a list as well. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I'll send these to you if you want them. Pergamum gets a list as well. Positive, negative, solutions and warnings and a reward. Thyatira gets one. Thank you, Stuart. Sardis gets as well. Thank you. Philadelphia, not the cheese, the place. Oh, I just kicked my Philadelphia there. That gets, Laodicea gets as well. And so what we get is this voice to the churches. Let me just read through that. I've amalgamated all of the positives and negatives for us to see and get a sense of what the Lord is saying to the churches. Now I want you to say, look at this and say, right, this is a word for them, but is it also a word for now? Can we learn from this? And most importantly, can we learn from it knowing that there's a God in heaven who loves us and who is giving us a beautiful promise? Amen. He's seen the works of the church, that was Ephesus, the labor that they're actually, not that they're busy, but that they're saying, I have a faith and I'm going to let my life demonstrate it. I have the Lord as my Lord and the Spirit in me and I'm going to live it. So the works and the labor, the endurance that they have to face through the hardships that are in front of them, the integrity of their faith. They're saying something and walking it that isn't to say they're perfect. Nobody is perfect, but there's an integrity in their faith. That, I love this, that they have willingly tested their leaders they haven't just thought, do you know, see when that guy gets up or that, that girl gets up and they speak, it's so entertaining. I love it. They make me laugh. I leave church on a Sunday morning thinking, man, that was fun. Oh, that was great. Or that was really political and that really ministered to my political persuasion. No, Jesus is saying to the churches and to one church in particular, you have tested your leaders. You've weighed them against the truth and you have found some of them to be wanting and you have told them to step aside. Is every church leader perfect? No. Have we seen church leaders fall short? Do I fall short? Am I perfect? If you want to know stories, speak to my family. Nobody's perfect, but here's the thing. When it comes to opening this book, any of us, when we speak, 
about Jesus? Are we speaking about Jesus as he would have us speak? They've tested their leaders. Perseverance, resolute in the face of persecution, not ashamed of the name. That was last week's focus with Paul. When Paul was imprisoned for years, he was beaten. He was, uh, he was publicly shamed. He lost his position in the community for Jesus. Their love and their faithfulness, their service, and I love this, they're maturing in their faith. What is the phrase in the word? I think it's something along the lines of your latter days are going to be better than your former days because you haven't settled in your faith. You've pursued Jesus and you know him and loved him more today than you did before. Anyone ever found that you've gone a bit cold? My hands up. Jesus is saying, come, let's be renewed in the things of the Lord. That is a, a call on the church. Let's not settle, but let's keep pressing on. And then he identifies dynamics of the church, the churches that are not good. Why seven churches? Well, many speculate it's because it's probably on the postal route uh, that the people would have gone on delivering things to the churches in, in, in the province of Asia Minor, or Asia, uh, which is now Turkey, so that region. But they are a church full of people. And churches full of people sometimes have their challenges. Some have abandoned their love for Christ. We're not going to point to anyone. We're not going to name names. All I'm going to ever ask of you is you say, right, in this list, for example, is there anything in here, Lord, that you're saying to me that I need the onion, the garlic? I need to be washed out of me by the power of, of God. Becoming weak in their resolve. So they used to be strong and now they're beginning to cave to the pressure. They're following the voices and teachings of others rather than Christ. Jezebel is mentioned in, in here among others. There's sexual immorality in the church, in these seven churches. Is there sexual immorality in the church? Absolutely. Is it something that must be addressed? Absolutely. We mentioned that in the kingdom ethics, that there is a sexual ethic for the church that God wants, and the call is on us to, to raise our standard to that. Idolatry, following after other gods, tolerating sin and sinful teaching, becoming dead to Christ, blended with culture and being lukewarm. Now, we're not going to labour on that, but I think we would say that when we look out at the Big Sea Church, and even when we look in at ourselves, we could say, have we got room to grow? Have we got the, to receive the challenge of transformation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Christ is calling us to. What is the solution? It's simple. Who loves simple? I love simple. Who's ever gone to do something and thought, man, that's really revealed my IQ? <laughs> Who loves the simple? I love simple. Repent. Just Let's be honest with ourselves. As a church, let's be honest. If we start to get lukewarm, let's be honest and deal with it. Let's return to what we have been originally taught. And as we open our Bibles, we see. What is the danger of just saying, I'm actually happy where I am. I see dynamics of that, but actually I don't care enough to change. Jesus speaks to the churches of a coming judgment. Let's, let's receive that with the weight that Jesus has delivered it. But let's look on. What is the reward that's offered to the church? The right to eat from the tree of life in paradise. Who thinks, bring it on, Jesus. We get to be back in that place of the perfect creation. Back to the start with Genesis, where they're walking in the garden in the cool of the day with the, with the Lord. We receive the crown of life, hidden manna and a new name. I love the pictures, this, this beautiful uh, picture of, of, of getting the sustenance that we need. 
the manna in the desert, a new name, that sense of new life, and of being seen by the God of heaven. Authority over the nations, dressed in white and granted eternal life, a people of renown and honour in the New Jerusalem. That is the promise for the churches. Now, will we get everything right all the time? Absolutely not, because we're people. But can we pursue Christ and be honest when we fall short? Yes. There's so much to, to say if I want to get to communion. But let me just close the word with this. What would Jesus say to us? What would he say to us? What would he say to us individually and corporately? And let's maybe flip that as well and say, what do we want him to say of us? Not for our sake, but that we could glorify him more. What do we want to receive from Christ? Remember, this is a God who loves us, who laid down his life for us, who saw fit to tell John, write these words, so that Stuart on the 17th, 19th, my watch, my watch date is now too small for me to read <laughs> without my glasses. Oh Lord. On the 19th of November, he saw fit Jesus to get John to write it so that in part Stuart on the 19th of November 2023 would proclaim something of it to remind us that he loves us and that there is something beautiful ahead for us. Amen. Take time if you have time this week just to read these letters to the churches. They're beautiful. They're sobering, they're encouraging. Praise God. Let's stand and worship as we close our time together. We'll take up our offering at this time as well. If you are giving directly to the church, we want to just say thank you so much for your generosity as we seek to serve each other and our community in Jesus' name. As the bags come round, I just invite you to pause and to give thanks to God for all that he's given into your life. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my soul. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my soul. You are good, you are good, you are so, so good. You are good, you are good, you are so, so good. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my soul. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the anchor of my days. Oh, he is my soul. You are good, you are good, you are so good. You are good, you are good, you are so, so good. You're never gonna let me down, no. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down, no. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down, no. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I am. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my soul. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life.